So we got halfway through chapter 7 last week, get to the most important part this week. But the amazing thing that I found that as I've been studying the, the past few weeks about this, and I'm going to talk more about it next week, but if, how many of you guys got your Bibles out right now? If you, if you got John chapter 7 open, skip to the very end. If you go down to the last verse, verse 53, it's got a little bracket there at the start, right? Who's got the little bracket at the start of verse 53? Where it, yeah, where it says, John 7, 53, and there's a little bracket, and then it says, and everyone went to his home. You don't have a bracket? A little bracket down to the other side, and it goes all the way down to chapter 8, verse 11. Right, and so the bracket starts there, and it goes all the way down to eight, chapter 8, verse 11. And basically, that's the story of the woman caught in adultery. We all know that story. It's one of the most famous ones in the Bible, where they all come with the stones to stone her, and then Jesus sits down, and he writes on the ground, and then he says, whoever's without sin cast the first stone, they all drop their stones and walk away, right? That's going to be next week's sermon. But the important thing about that is that the reason why the brackets are there is because that passage of the Bible isn't in any manuscript, any of the original Greek manuscripts for the first 400 years. So most of the Bible... I believe that the Bible was completed completely by 70 AD. So every copy for, that we have from 70 AD to 400 AD, every copy of John, none of them have 753 to 811. And it's only after 400 AD that that story appears in the Bible, which is why the brackets are there. If you look, and there'll be a little note that says, not in the earliest manuscripts. Do not have it. Right. The other thing which we're going to talk about next week more is that once it does start appearing in the Bible, it's in a whole bunch of different places. Sometimes it's in Mark, sometimes it's in Luke, sometimes it's here in John, and sometimes at the end of John. So nobody knows exactly how it got in there or who put it there or why. And we're still going to preach about it because we think it's still a valid picture of Jesus. It's just not there. And I think the most important thing about it is if it wasn't there at all, you would just read chapter 7 and chapter 8, 12, eight from 8, 12 on as if it was all the same day. As if what happened... On the, from verse 37, the last great day of the feast, starts and goes all the way through chapter 8. And it's really important for the next few weeks as we study chapters, the rest of chapter 7 here and the chapter 8. I think chapter 8, for the most part, for getting the woman caught in adultery, the rest of it still happens on this same day that we're going to be talking about here. And I'm just going to leave it there for now. And I'm going to explain. But if you read ahead as we go through this over the next couple weeks, I think you'll see what's important from some of the information that we're going to get today. If you remember back at the start of chapter 7, in verse 2, it says, Now the feast of the Jews, the feast of booths, was at hand. So this is taking place during the Feast of Tabernacles, or booths. It's a celebration of their time in the wilderness. And if we don't remember that, and I think a lot of time we just read this stuff and we don't think that the timing of when Jesus does what he does here is all that important. But when we understand the Feast of Booths, we'll see it's immensely important. I just want us to read one verse today, and it's the focal verse of chapter 7. So let's all read. Now on the last, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, 
If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. John 7, 37. Right off the bat, we've seen this before, haven't we? It's pretty much the same thing he says to the woman at the well, isn't it? If you knew who you were talking to, you'd ask me for a drink of water, and I'd give you water that if you drank it, you'd never thirst again. This is the same message, right? It's what we really need. The living water that Jesus gives us. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, I... I thank you that you've given us your word so that we can know who you are. That if we study and, and just go dig deep into your word, we get a true picture of who you are and what you were like when you were here on earth and how much you care about us, every single one of us. So Lord... I pray that as, as we continue on today, um, that you will, you will be the one speaking, that it's not me, that it's you, and that it'll be you hearing uh, with those of us who are listening, that you'll open our eyes and our ears and our hearts to this message and to who you are this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So just really quick, I'm going to read from where we stopped on through the rest. So we stopped at verse 31, so starting with 32, it says, The Pharisees heard the multitude muttering these things about him, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Jesus therefore said, For a little while longer I'm with you, then I go to him who sent me. You shall seek me and shall not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews therefore said to one another, where does this man intend to go that we shall not find him? He's not intending to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, you too will seek me and will not find me, and where I am you cannot come? Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If any man is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from his innermost being shall flow with shall flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive, for the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some of the multitude, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, certainly this is the prophet. Others were saying, this is the Christ. Still others were saying, surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there arose a division in the multitude because of him. And some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers therefore came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why didn't you bring him? The officers answered, Never did a man speak the way this man speaks. The Pharisees therefore answered them, you have not also been led astray, have you? Not one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed him, has he? But this multitude which does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus said to them, he who came to him before, being one of them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? They answered and said to him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. That's what we're going to be covering today. And like I said, verse 37, it's fairly early in this passage, and it's the most important thing that Jesus says here. So we're going to be looking at that most of all. It's the thing that's the most relevant to us today. But I want us to get a picture of what's actually happening here. So to go back a few points from last week, starting at verse 25. Remember that the whole, there, there were different crowds. There were people who were not from Jerusalem. There were people who were from Jerusalem. Everybody had a different opinion about Jesus, what he was doing. He went up to the feast in secret. In the middle of the feast, he stood up and started talking and teaching. The Pharisees got mad at him. They sent people to capture him, but no one could lay a hand on him. Even some of the crowd wanted to get him. 
The ones from Jerusalem says, isn't this the one they're trying to kill? Look, he's speaking boldly. Maybe the rulers know that he's the Messiah. But wait a second, we know where he's from. When the Christ comes, no one knows his origins. Remember, we just read later on, some people get it right. These guys don't even know the Bible. Jesus cries out in the temple where he's teaching. He says, you see me and you also perceive my origins and I'm not come from myself, but it's true, you don't understand who sent me. You don't really get where I'm coming from. And then where we ended, it says, they sought to seize him, but none laid hands on him because his hour had not yet arrived. And many of the multitude placed faith on him and said, when the Christ comes, will he accomplish any more supernatural acts than this one has done? Some people are starting to believe in him. Some people think... Well, maybe he's the Messiah because I don't think the Messiah could do anything more than this guy's doing. And remember, too, some were trying to seize him. None laid hands on him. From every indication that I get from studying this, this is supernatural. The people were trying to grab him, and they just couldn't. I was watching yesterday... Preparing for this, the, there's that movie, The Gospel of John, which is a word for word. Uh, it goes through the entire gospel, word for word. Now, when they filmed chapter 7, at every place where somebody tries to grab Jesus, because it says they try to seize him, and then later the officers come to try and get him, and every time they try and seize him in chapter 7 and chapter 8 of this movie... The crowd that likes Jesus stands in front and blocks the officers and blocks the people that are trying to grab him. I think that's a disservice to what the Bible actually says, though. Every indication says that Jesus just walked away or Jesus just said, my time's not now, you can't grab me. I'm not going to let you. And if we remember, even at the very end of John... When he's, the way John describes the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before Jesus dies, what happens? Judas and the people come to get Jesus, and the soldiers say, well, Jesus greets them, and he says, who are you looking for? And the soldiers say, Jesus of Nazareth. And Jesus says, I am he. And the soldiers, boom. Just Jesus saying, I am he, his words knock them back, knock them right on the ground. I had an interesting conversation with yesterday online. Somebody posted a question. I'm just going to ask you the question. And he, he gave three, it was a poll, and hundreds of people had answered it. And it was an A, B, or C question. And it said, who killed Jesus? The question was, who killed Jesus? And the choices were the Romans, the Jews, or all of us. So C, right? Then we, people were saying, ah, the Romans, the, it was Roman soldiers that nailed his hands and put him up on the cross and they speared him. And other people were saying, no, 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 it was the Jews that wanted it done. The Jews made the Romans do it. And other people were saying, oh, it's C. It's all of us. Every single one of our sins, that's what killed Jesus. I said, D, none of the above. Because what the Bible says and what Jesus says about who killed Jesus, Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I lay down my life for the sheep and no one takes it from me. And if we think back to Easter, in Isaiah 53, when we were going through Isaiah 53 at Easter, it says that God was pleased to crush him and that he laid down his life for us. So in the question, who killed Jesus? The answer is, he gave himself and no one could take his life from him. And, if, and people got mad at me when I said that. No, 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 the Romans put the nails in. And I said, yeah, even Jesus up on the cross, if Jesus on the cross had just decided, no, I'm not going to do this, I'm coming down, when the people were saying, Come down off the cross and save yourself. He could have. He could have walked right off the cross, healed his body, just then and there, and the heck with all the rest of us, because our sins would not be forgiven. 
Jesus died, and he had complete control of the situation every second along the way. One of the proofs of that is right here. People tried to seize him, and no one could, because Jesus just said, no, I'm in charge. And my time has not yet come. And when Jesus' time came, when they came to get him, who are you looking for? Jesus. I'm him. He knocked him down the first time just to show he was still in charge. So when you consider how much Jesus loves you, know every second along the way, as the nails were about to go in, even after the nails went in, every single step along the way, Jesus was in control. And he did it for us. Now we're actually going to start the sermon for today. Verse 32, the Pharisees heard the multitudes murmuring such things about him. Remember last week, it said everybody had something to say about Jesus, but they were saying it quietly because they were afraid of who? The Pharisees. Well, the Pharisees finally hear them. They're being a little bit too noisy. The Pharisees heard them murmuring, and the chief priests and the Pharisees sent their subordinates to seize him. Remember, this is probably the third or fourth day of the feast, eight-day feast. Subordinates come, and Jesus says, I'm still with you a short time, and I am going to him that sent me. You shall seek and won't find me, and where I am, you're not able to go. This is another place where we need to just read this verse and get down on our knees and thank God that this thing that he says here doesn't apply to us. Where I'm going, you can't come. He's telling these people, I know your hearts. You don't believe in me now and you're never going to. And I'm going up to my father and you're not coming with me. It's a dangerous, horrible place to be, isn't it? They don't get it all. The Jews said to themselves, where is he going to go so that we can't find him? He's not going to those dispersed by the Greeks. Will he travel and teach the Greeks? What is the intent of his saying, you shall seek and won't find me, and where I am you're not able to go? We got no idea. What does he mean? We think you want to be a king. You can't go out to the Jews who've been spread all over the world by the Greeks. You can't build an army that way. You can't take over our land that way. They had no clue whatsoever what Jesus was really all about. Remember last week, the start of chapter 7, what did his brother say? You want to be a somebody, you got to go up to the big time. Jesus goes up to the big time, and the big time people say, you want to be somebody, you're going to have to kick us out of our spot. How are you going to do that if you go off to the Greeks? Their minds were just down here on earth. They had no sense of heaven at all. They had no sense of the plan. And these were the people that were the keepers of the book, that had the plan. So on the last day of the feast, the greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cries out, If any thirst, let them come to me and drink. As the script describes, Out of the innermost being shall flow liver, rivers of living water. A little bit of a tongue twister. Out of the innermost being shall flow rivers of living water to those who trust in me. Now this he spoke about the Spirit, which those placing faith in him would afterwards receive, because the Spirit was not yet given, as Jesus was not yet glorified. Getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, think about when Jesus tells the disciples, the last night, in the upper room, I'm going away. What's their reaction? Heartbroken. And Jesus says, no, 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 it's good that I'm going away. Because if I go, I'll send the comforter. Who'll be with you always. Not just sitting here with you 12 guys, but I'll be inside you. It's much better for you if I go away. And Jesus is talking about that here in chapter 7. 
Rivers of living water will flow out from inside you. And John says, this was, he's talking about the Spirit. We didn't understand it at the time. We didn't know what he was talking about at all. But we know now he's talking about the Spirit. But we couldn't get the Spirit yet because Jesus hadn't died and he hasn't risen and he wasn't glorified. And once that all happened, then the Spirit came. We can all have that river of life flowing out of us. Just reading that, that sounds great, right? But when you really understand the Feast of Booths, it makes that more, a little more impressive. So let's look at this. The Feast of Booths. It was one of the three great festivals. They called it the Pilgrimage Festivals. There were three of them. There was Passover, which happened in springtime, and it commemorated the start of their journey when they were slaves in Egypt, and they killed the lamb, and they spread the blood over the house, and it saved the firstborn in each house. Fifty days later was the celebration of Pentecost, the Feast of Weeks, and it was a celebration of the time that it took from after the Passover, they went out, they went through the Red Sea, to when they got to Mount Sinai. In Jesus' day, a lot of the people that would come, because obviously travel took a long time, if you were going to Jerusalem for the Passover, sometimes you just stayed another month and a half for the Feast of Weeks. But the Feast of Booths, it's the whole other side of the year. In September, October, our time, after the harvest, there's the, there's the festival day of Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, the festival of trumpets. And then a, a week later, there's the Day of Atonement. And then the week after that is a week-long festival called the Feast of Booths, Sukkot. It celebrates the whole 40 years that they were in the wilderness living in tents when God lived with them. Remember, God didn't just leave them on his own. During the day, there was the cloud. At night, there was fire. He led them every step of the way. So it's also known as Sukkot, or the Feast of Tabernacles. And there's three main rituals in the Feast of Booths. Every day, there's the Simchat Bet Hashova, and I can't say that right. It's basically rejoicing at the place of the water drying. So what the priests would do, they can't do it now because the temple is gone. But in Jesus' day, what they would do is every day of the feast, the priests would go down from the temple out through the water gate to the pool of Siloam, which was one of those fresh pools in Jerusalem. And they would go down. Here's some reenacting it because they've refound the Pool of Siloam and they've made it a pool again. So they're going down and they're reenacting the drawing the water out of the Pool of Siloam. They would have, in Jesus' day, golden pitchers that they would gather the water from. And then at night, there was the illumination. At night, they would light these four gigantic menorahs and the light would cover all of Jerusalem. You could see it all over the countryside, these gigantic lights up on the hill. And then every day they celebrated the building of the sukkah, the tent. They would just live there. But that simchat beit heshova, the drawing of the place of water, as the priest would draw the water in the golden pitchers and start walking back to the temple, all the people would recite Isaiah 12, 3. Therefore, you will joyously draw water from the springs of salvation. We just sang that, didn't we? Water from the well of salvation. The Lord is my strength and my song. But on the last day, after singing the Hallel, the Hallel is Psalm, basically it's a section of the Psalms, Psalm 113 to 118. They would sing six songs on the way back to the temple. Listen to some of the words of these songs. Praise the Lord. Praise servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth forever. From the rising of the sun to the setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all the nations. His glory is above the heavens. 
Who is like our God, who is enthroned on high, who humbles himself to behold the things that are in heaven and the earth? He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy off the ash heap and makes them sit with princes, the princes of his people. He makes the barren woman abide in the house as a joyful mother of children. Praise the Lord. That's Psalm 113. Psalm 118 says, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever. Let Israel say, his love endures forever. Let the house of Aaron say, his love endures forever. Let those who fear the Lord say, his love endures forever. Again and again, his love endures forever. As they're walking back to the temple with the water in the golden pitchers, and they walk up onto the altar, and everybody gets quiet. The priest pours the water, the living water from the pool of Siloam, onto the altar. This amazing, solemn moment celebrating God's love for his people that he kept them for 40 years in a desert. Everybody's quiet. But this day, Jesus stands up right at this point And he says, if any thirst, let him come to me and drink. I am the water. I am the living water. Think about it in the desert when they thought they were going to die, when there's no water around. God says to Moses, talk to the rock. <laughs> Moses talks to a rock. And what happens? Water starts pouring out of the rock. Well, what does the New Testament say about that rock? It says that the rock was Christ. Christ was the rock in the wilderness giving them water. That's why Moses got in trouble the second time, because he was mad at the people for complaining because they didn't believe. And instead of just talking to the rock the second time, what did he do? He hid it. And because of that, he couldn't enter the promised land. But guess what? Even though God was mad at the people because they were hard-hearted and because they had no faith, and he was angry with Moses for hitting the rock because he was the rock, he still gave him water, didn't he? These hard-hearted people who kept rejecting Jesus again and again and again. And Jesus stands up on the solemn day and says, I am the living water. If any is thirsty, come to me and drink. Read the scripture. Out of the innermost being shall flow rivers of living water to those who believe in me. To me, that sounds incredible. I'd like to think that if I'd been standing there, I'd have been like, yeah, I want that water. I've seen what this guy can do. But the truth is, the majority probably went, this guy's ruining another festival. Will he ever shut up? A solemn moment, and this guy is out of his mind, and he thinks that he is God. Jesus is saying here, I'm the God who gives you the living water. Some were convinced at this point. Look at this. It says, therefore, when those of the throng, the multitude, the nobodies, the losers, what in the Greek would be called the hoi polloi, just the little nobody people, they heard this, they said, this is truly the prophet. He is truly the one. Remember when they went out to John the Baptist two years before this? Are you the prophet? No. Are you the Christ? No. This is the prophet. This is the Christ. This has to be. We thought John was cool, but this is the one. Some say the Christ can't come out of the Galilee. Doesn't the Bible say that Christ comes out of the seed of David from the town of Bethlehem, where David was from? So there was a division. They were arguing. Some actually knew the Bible. Remember last week, the people in the crowd, nobody will know where the Messiah is from. This crowd, oh no, 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 
The Christ comes from the city of David, from Bethlehem. The Messiah is coming from the line of David. We know this. This is right there in the Bible. And again, you ruined our festival. We're just going to grab you now. Some desired to seize him, but none laid hands on him. Not his time. Then the subordinates who'd been sent out earlier in the week, the officers of the chief priests and the Pharisees, they go back to the chief priests and the Pharisees, and the latter said to the former, you didn't bring him. Why didn't you bring him? We gave you one job. Subordinates answered, never at any time has anyone spoken like this man. When I read this from what I read right before, where it says some desired to seize him and none laid hands on him, the Pharisees say, why didn't you grab him? And the officers just say, nobody has ever talked like this guy. And the impression the officers didn't even try. You know, we heard what he said. And nobody talks like him. Maybe you should think about it, guys. Boss, maybe you should listen to what he's saying. He really listen to what he's saying. And they say, oh, are you guys deceived too? He tricked you too? Not one of the rulers or any of the Pharisees have placed faith in him. Not one of us believes in him, guys. You better get back on the right page with us. We're in charge, remember? They say, but the multitudes who don't know the Bible, who don't know the law, they're cursed. They're cursed, so they're deceived. We know the law, and we are the ones who are okay. So you better get back on plan with us. Or we'll just say you're cursed too. It's really what they're saying right here. Are you going to listen to him or are you going to listen to us? Because we're the ones in charge. All those other losers down there, the nobodies, of course they believe in him because they don't know the Bible like we do. They don't know the scriptures like we do. None of us believe in him. Better stay with us. Because you know what we're going to do to him. We'll do it to you too. That's what the Pharisees are saying. And at this point, Nicodemus, who left the story four chapters ago, remember Nicodemus in chapter 3, when did he come to Jesus? At night. So none of his friends knew he went to talk to Jesus. When he went to talk to Jesus, what was the question on his mind? How do I get to heaven? Nicodemus at this point stands up and he says to him, hey, our law doesn't condemn people prior to hearing from them and knowing what they say. We've got to play by the rules here, guys. We've got to do what the law says. We've got to at least hear what he has to say before we condemn him, right? Everybody else says to him, you know what? Are you from his town? Are you from Galilee as well? They turn on Nicodemus. Are you from Galilee too? Where are you from again? Are you really one of us? Maybe you should investigate again concerning this and see no prophet arises out of Galilee. You know, if we didn't know this, we just think they're making some sort of claim. But this is just how willing they were to lie to reject Christ. Look it up, Nicodemus. There's no prophets that come from Galilee. Nothing good comes out of Galilee. Except read Jonah. And guess where Jonah was from? Galilee. And read Nahum. Nobody reads those little guys, right? Their book is one page long. Nahum was from Galilee. Hosea. Hosea is like 10, 11 chapters. Hosea was from Galilee. 
It's also possible that Elijah and Elisha were from Galilee, depending on where you draw the lines and where their town exactly was. But for sure, three guys who were prophets in the Bible were from Galilee. And here are these experts saying to one of their own, look it up, man. None of them came from Galilee. Prophets don't come from Galilee. This is just, when I, I don't watch the news because I don't have a television, <laughs> but when I see news reports coming across the internet and it says something like CNN or MSNBC, it's these Pharisees. They don't care what the facts are anymore. We get that with our country today, that the media and the, a lot of the people in charge just don't care what the facts are. You're on our side or you're the enemy. It's just like that for these guys. Nicodemus, you want to be one of us? There's only 70 of us in the whole country. You can be replaced pretty easily, man. You better get back on board. Because maybe we'll just start. You come from Galilee too. We don't really need you. Check it out and see. That's where this leaves off. That's where this stops. And we go on to that little story about the woman caught in adultery. I don't believe it's supposed to be there. Because if we just started reading on at verse 12, it says again, therefore Jesus spoke to them, I am the light of the world. Remember the story of the Feast of Booths the last day. What do they do in the morning? Pour the water. What do they do at night? They light as big a fire as they can. Jesus again says, I am the light of the world. And we're going to leave that for two weeks. Let's go back to what Jesus is saying to each one of us. If anybody's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. There's three verbs here. Thirst. Are you thirsty? Do you have a need? Do you recognize the need? If you're thirsty, come to me. If you're thirsty, you realize your need, you have to come. You have to approach the source, and then you have to drink. And if you drink, the living water will then be within you, and you'll never be thirsty again. Not for real water, we know that from chapter 4 but from the spiritual water. He says, out of the innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. Remember, in chapter 4, he told the woman at the well, you'll never be thirsty again. Here he says, not only you drink this water, the water is going to be in you, and it's going to flow out of you. You become the river to everyone else that's thirsty. calls back to Isaiah again. Look what it says in Isaiah 58. The Lord will continually guide you and satisfy your desire in scorched places. If you're in a scorched place, what are you going to be most desiring? Water. And it'll give strength to your bones. You'll be like a watered garden. And like a spring of water whose waters will not fail. The water that comes in you, you never be thirsty again. And you will, be the, you will be the fountain that provides the water to everyone else. That's what we become. That's what we should become when the Spirit comes into us. This he spoke about the Spirit. If you believe in Jesus, you will receive it. Now John is saying that here, he and the other disciples... They heard this and they did not get the Spirit immediately. They had to wait until Jesus died, rose again, and then was glorified. And ten days after he ascended up into heaven, they got the Spirit at Pentecost. But for all of us who live on the other side of Pentecost, the instant that we 
place faith in Jesus Christ, the instant that we believe, the Holy Spirit enters in. And we have that fountain of life which will never thirst again. One more thing about the Feast of Booths. I know we're going over time. Remember back to the start when John is giving his overview. In chapter 1, verse 14, the way that he describes Jesus coming to earth, he says the word became flesh, and in the Greek, it means he set his tent among us. Now, if you remember back to when we talked about when Jesus was born at Christmas time, very likely Jesus was born in that September time. I actually believe he was born on Rosh Hashanah, the festival of trumpets, because as we're going to be talking about in a couple weeks, all the Jewish festivals point to Jesus. I believe he was born on Rosh Hashanah. I believe he was circumcised on the Day of Atonement, the shedding of blood. What comes right after that is the Feast of Booths. The Word became flesh and set his tent among us. He came down and lived in booths with us. In the Bible, our body itself is described as a tent. The tent of our body. And at the end... Remember John wrote Revelation, right? And what does Jesus say in Revelation? Look here, man. I'm standing at the door knocking. And if anybody hears my voice and opens up the door, I will enter into them. I'll dine with them and them with me. Have you ever noticed that Revelation 3.20 is an open-ended thing? It's not a one-time event. Jesus isn't saying here, I'm standing at the door knocking, and if you open it up, we'll come in, we'll have a nice lunch date. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm standing at the door knocking, and if you open it up and let me come in, I'm going to just stay with you forever. And you ain't going to be able to kick me out. You ever have one of those guests that stays too long, and you're just like, are you ever going to leave? That's the kind of house guest Jesus is. You let him in, he's never leaving. And that's the best thing that can ever happen to any one of us. Is if we open up the door and let him in. I know we've all done that, right? So why are we thirsty? Why do we get thirsty? We get thirsty, don't we? I only have one answer for that. If we let Jesus in, if the river of life is in us, if we're thirsting, it's because we're standing there holding it down. We're holding it down for ourselves. I'm not going to drink. I know you're there, and I'm not going to drink. And we're also holding it off for everybody else. If you're thirsty, but you have the fountain of life within you, Take the hand off of the spigot. It's like that kid's game where you would, you know, you're running around in the summertime playing with the water hose and somebody just hold it down. Where'd the water go? Remember like you're five years old? What happened to the water? And then you walk up and you look at the hose and they go. I <laughs> <laughs> see that's happened to every single one of us, hasn't it? The older kids that just, and then it goes right up your nose. <laughs> This time the fountain's within us. And if we're thirsty, we just got to unkink that hose and just let it go. It's not God that's walked away. It's us that are standing on the hose. Let it out. Amen? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you that you are a river of life within us. That your spirit came and he never leaves. And we never need to thirst. Lord, I pray that if we're thirsting, we'll turn to you. We just drop down to our knees. Get out of the way and let you take over. Lord, I pray as we go from here, we will be that river of life to this world that's dry and scorched. 
continually my prayer. 